back uh, to some verses before the passage we read this morning, just to let you know why Paul's office were in, in prison. Um, and by the way, more can be said about this story, uh, especially what follows after. Um, but we're also going to get to a few things today. So uh, do your own study and, and application of some other truth and good stuff for our lives in this in this passage. But look up at verse 16. I want to read uh, 16 up, up to 24 just to give you some context. This is Paul and Silas. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who claim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Paul seemingly didn't want association uh, with their ministry and a, and a demon, even though she was saying they were they were bringing salvation. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them into the, uh, brought them to the magistrates, they said, "These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice." And the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into the prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safe. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And so the jailer put them in the most secure part of prison and put their feet in, in stocks. They, you know, the things that were kind of like, I guess, handcuffs for your feet, they kept your feet on the floor, the wall, where it was mounted. And from what I read, they they, could, they had all kinds of different holes that would, you know, stretch you out, maybe, uh, to torture you some. Um, so that's what happened, and that's why they were in prison. What I want us to see this morning, very simply, two things. I want us to see what true rejoicing is and what true rescue is. True rejoicing and true rescue. First, let's look at uh, Paul and Silas' situation and, and how that applies to us. Uh, Paul and Silas were treated unfairly. Okay? Um, it, their, their unfair treatment was likely fueled by anti-Jewish sentiment. Um, Anti-Semitism is not a new thing. Um, it has been around for a long time. And uh, you notice these men, Jews, you know, you know whatever. So, it was likely fueled by anti-Jewish sentiment, and to beat to beat a Roman citizen of whom Paul and Silas were, to beat publicly a Roman citizen was a no-no, especially assuming a Roman citizen guilty without trial, and they weren't tried. It was unfair, unjust treatment, so, so, and then they were beaten. So beaten, untried, in the most secure part of the prison, feet fastened in likely painful socks, they were treated wrong. Now, being a Christian, doing the will of the Lord, even as Paul and Silas were here, doesn't exempt us from persecution for our faith. It doesn't exempt us from hard times. It doesn't exempt us from unjust treatment. It doesn't exempt us from the hard times that come to everyone. And as it relates to persecution for our faith, listen to what Jesus said, John 15, 20. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Paul, 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 1 Peter 4.12. Peter here. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Persecution is going to come to believers. But like everyone else on this planet, Believers also go through other hard times, maybe unrelated to persecution for our faith. Times when we're treated poorly. Times when we're treated unjustly. Times when we feel trapped, hopeless, misunderstood, hurt, 
abused, used, fearful, frustrated. Times when we feel out of control and the future is uncertain. Times that we feel like we are in somewhat of a metaphorical prison cell, beaten and bloody. And during those times, God is worthy of the response of Paul and Silas during their prison episode. So we learn, one, they did not grumble and they did not complain. Nowhere in this passage do we have any evidence that they grumbled or complained, but quite the opposite. Yet how do we often respond in the times of which I just spoke? We whine. We fight. We defend ourselves. We complain. It's not fair. I don't understand. Either you have no right to, or you have no right to, whatever. Why is this happening to me? Can you believe this? Poor, pitiful me. We turn into professional Eeyores. We may not realize it, but people around us can tell us that we're a bunch of whiners and complainers. With thoughts fixed on ourselves, we constantly complain, moan, argue, grumble. And when our joy and our identity, listen, when our, when our joy and our identity are tied to temporary things, things like our security, our rights, our health, our relationships, our finances, or any fair treatment that we think we deserve, when our joy and our identity are tied to those things, those temporary things, we're prone to grumble and complain when they're threatened to be taken away from us. And as such, by the way, we indicate that those things are likely idols in our lives. Paul, we're going we're gonna to look throughout this message this morning, we're going to look at some passages from the book of Philippians. Paul wrote the book of Philippians from being imprisoned, likely in Rome. So everything you hear from Philippians this morning when I read it is Paul writing from prison, from being chained up in Rome in prison. This is the first thing we'll read this morning. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Paul from prison. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Listen. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. From prison, Paul is saying, don't grumble and complain. Grumbling and complaining do not let the children of God shine like lights in a dark world. No, we sound just like everybody else whining in this world. So we don't grumble. But look what they did. They didn't grumble, they didn't complain. They prayed and they praised. About midnight, midnight, mind you, last night at midnight, my little baby girl didn't help lead my, especially my wife, to praise. Right? Midnight is not the time where our thoughts are normally fixed on how great God is, much less after having been beat with rods and fast, you know, fastened to stocks, maybe, maybe painfully. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Not about God, to God. I like that. And the prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas didn't want them against or about their captors or their abusers for other prisoners to hear. They prayed and they sang praises to God for other prisoners to hear. They weren't examples to the other prisoners of how to whine, but how to worship. They didn't know an earthquake was coming, but they praised and rejoiced anyway. Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18 says this. He says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, two men treated unjustly showed other prisoners who were locked up that their joy, Paul and Silas' joy, was not in the circumstances, but in their God. Wow. Our testimony in this world should not be wah, 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 but Jesus is worthy, worthy, worthy. 
Harry Ironside says this, the unsaved people of the world are watching Christians. And when they see Christians shaken by circumstances, they conclude that after all, there is very little to Christianity. But when they find Christians rising above circumstances and glorifying in the Lord, even in deepest trial, then the unsaved realize the Christian has a comfort to which they are strangers. End quote. When worship is in bold font on our life's billboard in the hardest times of our lives, we shine like lights, shining a spotlight on our great Savior, showing the watching world that Jesus is of greater value than anything our hard times threaten to take away from us. So here's my question to you and me. Is the world hearing whining or worshiping from you in your hard times? There's always reason to rejoice. Always. If you're a believer, your sin is forgiven. If you're a believer, your sin is forgiven. If you're a believer, you have eternal life beyond this unjust life. Nothing, everybody say nothing. Nothing can separate us from God's love or snatch us from Christ's hand. Listen to Peter in the first chapter of Peter, verses 3 through 7. Mm. This first phrase has an exclamation mark at the end of it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, he says. On persecution for the faith, listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 5. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we rejoice in persecution. Jesus says we're blessed. Back to Paul, imprisoned in Rome, writing Philippians, chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Mm, this is so good. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as false because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. The word actually there is dumb. And count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. What an attitude. Paul realized that the only way he could be in Christ was not in any of his pedigree. Read the verses before this. Not at, not at all the, the check marks and the, the, the social status column or the religious status column of his day. Not in his good works. It was only through faith in Christ and what Christ did. And when, when Paul knew Christ as his Lord, that was a more su surpassing birth to him. And he welcomed, welcomed, welcomed the sufferings that being identified with Jesus brought. I didn't plan to do this, but um, I saw a buddy of mine, actually a pastor from Canada, uh, just a couple days ago, um, posted a quote from this guy, and I was like, hey, I've heard of him, and I went and I actually have this, this book, I've never read it, but I remember that I had it. I think I need to read it now. This is Richard Wormbrand. He, um, he was in prison, in a communist prison for 14 years, beaten for Christ. It's called Tortured for Christ. I think this book has sold like 10 million copies. Listen to what he says. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was called during doing this received a severe beating. 
A number of us decide to pay the price for the privilege of preaching, so we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached, and they beat us. We were happy preaching, they were happy beating us, so everyone was happy. The following scene happened more times than I can remember. A brother was preaching to the other prisoners when the guards suddenly burst in, surprising him halfway through a phrase. They hauled him down the corridor to the beating room. After what seemed an endless beating, they brought him back and threw him bloody and bruised on the prison floor. Slowly, he picked his battered body up, painfully straightened his clothing, and said, now brethren, where did I leave off when I was interrupted? He continued his gospel message. We hate suffering. Paul and people like Richard Wormbrand welcomed it for the ministry of the gospel. So whether it's persecution or any other hard times in our lives, we can rejoice, Romans 8, 28, for God, for, for those who love God, all things work together for his good, for those who are called according to his purpose. He even works trouble, persecution, hard times, sickness, he even works he, everything. He works trouble for our good, and one day the greatest trouble you face on this earth will melt away in the light of his glory and grace. You know, we sing, when we've been there 10,000 years, you know, when you've been there 10,000 years, what happened to you today and yesterday and even up to the end of your life is not even going to be a it's just going to be melting away because for 10,000 years you have been in the presence and glory and grace of your God and Savior have that attitude now be willing to, to suffer and, and, and be willing to take trouble and hard time and do like Paul and just continue to rejoice in the middle of trouble, get your thoughts off yourself and onto your God. Listen to Psalm 103. David, bless the Lord, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Believer, that is true of you. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to, to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to his commandments. The Lord established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Believer, in hard times, let's, let's get our eyes off of ourselves and onto our great God that we may see in the hard times. And focusing on the worth of your great God and the abundant blessings that are ours because of knowing Him, they will make prison walls hear our great praises. Why? Because our value is beyond those prison walls. And those prison walls, they, their damp despair can extinguish the flame of our praise. Listen to what G. Campbell Morgan says. Paul didn't sing because he was to be let out of prison. He sang because prison did not matter. 
Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Not just in good times, but in the bad times too. It's easy to rejoice when our tank is full, but do we find ourselves rejoicing when it's empty? Church, we glory in God and not our circumstances. What, what a witness to others of God's great worth when they hear not whining, but worship from a life battered with trouble. Again, Harry Ironside says, there is no circumstance in which the believer can be found where the Lord is not able to sustain him and lift him above trial and enable him to rejoice. So, let me get specific. Believer, your joy is not tied to this next election. Your joy is not tied to who's in the White House or the governor's mansion. Our joy is not tied to what happens after this next election. If the unthinkable thing happens, then Obviously, none of us want to see happen, but let's say we turn into a socialist, communist, Marxist nation that, that persecutes Christians, and stories like this happen. Our joy is tied to that. If, if after this next election, or even, you know, and we turn into, something happens in our nation, and we turn into the most liberty-loving, unified nation where Christians live in complete ease and freedom, our joy is out of that either. Our joy isn't what our country does for us, but in what Jesus did for us. Our joy is not glued to our health, our financial status, people's opinions of us, or the stability of a certain relationship. What terribly about others being brought to Christ. And then, if you keep going, we read this part of the story, but in the morning, they're still in jail. In our hard times, may we not only care for relief, but for God to use our hard times to bring people to Jesus. Amen? All right, lastly. True rejoicing. Let's look at true rescue that happened. So they're singing hymns to God at midnight. Prisoners are listening. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Pause. Look. He knew that what was coming to him because of the prisoners escaping was not going to be good. And so he just said, I'll just off myself right here. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. What a story. After this earthquake and all this stuff, the, the jailer knew something supernatural was going on, apparently. So he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? To which they responded, believe in the Lord Jesus. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, no doubt the gospel, and to all his household. And then this jailer and each of his family members trusted Christ. They each were baptized. They each made a profession of faith. It wasn't like the it wasn't like the jailer said, "Hey, I'm going to be saved, and all y'all are too, whether you like it or not." No, they were all baptized. They were all trusted in Christ. They all believed the message of the gospel and believed in Christ and were baptized. So let me just say something really quickly to heads of households, of which I am one. Heads of households, do not diminish your influence to lead your family to Christ and disciple them. Take it seriously. 
The jailer asked the most crucial question anyone could ask, what must I do to be saved? And the response of Paul and Silas teaches us the only answer to that question, by believing and putting our faith in Jesus. He asked what he should do, but notice their answer, the only doing was what? Believing. We can't do anything to be saved. Nothing we do would ever be enough. No amount of good deeds that we do could be enough. We're sinners to our core, and we have no ability to be perfectly righteous. And even if we could, nothing we could do could make up for the sin we've already done. We are unworthy, we're unrighteous, and we deserve God's wrath for our rebellion against Him. For how we love other things more than Him. For how we've stolen His glory to give to other things, our idols. For how we've declared Him unworthy to be our master by our disobedience to His commands. For our egregious sin against an infinite God, we deserve eternal hell for our sins. And that's what we're going to get if we aren't forgiven by God. But to rescue us, God sent Jesus. I remember in verse from VBS, was John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. God said, I don't want you to suffer eternal wrath. I love you. And so I'm going to send Jesus so you can have eternal life. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent Jesus to bear the wrath that our sins deserve when He died on the cross. And His payment was sufficient to satisfy God's wrath. And we know that because He is now risen and glorified, not condemned anymore. So any effort on your part to be good, to do, it isn't sufficient to be righteous before God. We've got to be perfect. We've got to appear perfect before God, perfectly righteous. And to do that, we can only be made righteous through faith in, what, in the sufficiency of what Christ has done for us. That's the only way to be forgiven and made right with God, justified. The only way we can, we can be made right with God is to say, God, I, I can't be made right with you on my own. And I have to be given a foreign righteousness, one that is not inherent to me or capable to be achieved by me, but one that is foreign to me that Jesus has because he did everything right and he's perfect and he perfectly fulfilled the law. And so that has to be given to me. It has to be credited to my account. And so when we put our faith in Christ, right, Jesus takes our sin, it's applied to the cross, he died for it, he punished for it, he paid the penalty for it, and then he gives to us something we don't deserve, nor could earn, his righteousness, and before God, we look perfectly clean and righteous. Therefore, since we have been justified, made right with God, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll do this really quickly. You've, you've heard this illustration, I'm sure. What is faith? What does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus? What is faith? It's, it's like a chair. You sit in a chair, right? When you sit in a chair, you're putting the weight, uh, all the hope of not falling and hitting your tush on the floor. You're putting, it, you're putting all your faith in that chair. And you know somebody really doing that because you're, you've been in a room, right? Where somebody goes to sit down in that chair and it's like, pulls the chair out under what happens? They get carpet burn on their hand. Right? They, they fall because they have put all the weight, all the hope of them sitting up on that chair. And that's what putting faith in Christ is. It's saying, God, all the weight of my hope, all the hope of my forgiveness, everything, I'm trusting only in what Jesus did to forgive my sin. And that's the only way I can be saved. So, knowing that, here's what we do. We admit our sin. We turn from it in repentance. We hate it. We ask God to forgive us from it. We're putting all the hope of that forgiveness in what Christ has done to pay for our sin, to cleanse us from it, to make us righteous before God. And then, a life of repentance will naturally follow as God's Spirit resides in every believer and begins to do the work of sanctification in our hearts. 
leading to glorification in our eternal age. Jesus says this, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. So believer, if that is true, and it is, then the billboard of our lives should scream, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Sadly, the billboards of our lives shout some pretty pointless, temporary, worldly things. The latest news, drama, national discussion, our opinions, you name it. That's what's coming off the billboards of our lives. The gospel gets relegated to mere fine print, if that. We've got to repent. What should be coming off of our lives right now, the only hope for this nation is Jesus, by the way. You know that, right? There's nothing, there's nothing any ungodly sinner can do to, to start living for Christ except believe in Christ and be saved and transformed by Christ. Man, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Let that shout for your life more than it does. Man, I, I got to quit it. I bet I can say this. If, I want you to start to look at let's Let's just talk social media for a second. Or just conversation you had. Let's start to look from other people's perspective. If people were to define you by what they see you post, what they hear you say in normal conversation, wherever you are, what will people think is your most valuable treasure? The Second Amendment or Jesus? Democracy or salvation? I'm not saying we don't work for good in this world and Christians have a, have, a, have a voice in those conversations, but my goodness, let's talk more about Jesus than that stuff that's going to fade when the kingdom of God comes and is established forever. By his amazing grace, God has intervened in the life of the jailer and his family after midnight and he rocked their world. And he did that for you too, remember? So praise his name. This jailer went from suicide to salvation, evidencing his salvation by his loving care of his new brothers in Christ and rejoicing in his salvation. What a transformation. God can do anything. The gates of hell truly won't prevail when Jesus builds his church. So let's make sure when we are praying to our powerful, earthquake-sending God that we aren't only praying for our personal deliverance from whatever prison we find ourselves in, but that we are praying for His power to be displayed in the salvation of souls through our witness to them. That with each soul saved, one more life will be added to the chorus of rejoicing and worship through good times and bad of which our great God is worthy. And God, you are worthy. Forgive us, God, when we whine, when we complain, when we don't look at the things that you allow in our lives as opportunities to be to, to, to grow us, but, but you also shine like lights in this world to show how great you are as we trust you and praise and rejoice and share the gospel. And how that you use hard times in our lives to let the gospel go forth. Oh, God, change our attitudes, change our conversations. May we shine like lights in a dark, twisted, corrupt world. 